All right, Winning Plays Podcast is back. My name is Brian Robb, joined today by the one and only Tom Westerholm, sports reporter extraordinaire at Boston.com. Follow him on Twitter at Tom underscore MBA. I think you also have an at, is this, is at by Tom Westerholm still active somewhere? Is that, is that in the archives? This, uh, if you want to, if you want to go back through my, uh, my thoughts on like Springfield high school basketball from like 2015 to 2017, you'll find some great takes in there. Shout out Ty Nichols, shout out, shout out Ty on Malone, uh, shout out Taylor Martin, just absolute studs, fun guys to cover. All right. We'll be digging into that later in the show, but for <laughs> now, Let's start. Uh, Boston Celtics have won. What is this? Is it like, I want to say like 20 of 23, something crazy yeah. um, in the last two minutes. I mean, we know, I think like 26 and seven over their last 33 games. Wrapped up a four game road trip um, with another blowout win in Oklahoma City that got a little tight at the end on Monday night. Tom, Celtics have nine games left. They are tied for the number two seed with the Sixers and the Bucks right now. And I'll leave it to you. You're the guest here. Do we want to talk about the trip or do we want to talk about the standings and the jockeying in the Eastern Conference playoff picture? Because I think that's going to be the most fascinating subplot ever to see how, like, I think it's already honestly kind of started with teams, guys already getting rested on certain teams. So what direction do you want to go on here? Yeah, let's do the standings because I think, I mean, we, like we could touch on the road trip real quick. It's just like, I mean, like they played great, right? It's like, <laughs> it's almost like nothing left to really Boring. say. Like we've, we've seen this team play great since the start of 2022 and they kept it up on the road trip, which like very impressive, but like, I don't have much more to add. Yeah. Tatum's like a superstar. Like, you know, like um, these guys play great defense. Jalen's really good. So I don't know. Those are my thoughts on the road trip, mm-hmm. but I, but I, I think the jockeying is really interesting because I think one of the things that you can, you can look at, right. is like the Sixers do not seem like they want to play the nets at all. Like they just seem a little bit shook by having to play Brooklyn in the first round. And I kind of understand that, but I'm curious what you think. Like, I think the Celtics should probably grab, they I'm sure they would rather not play the nets, but at the same time, I don't know. I don't know that they have to fear the nets. Like the, sure. You'd rather have an easier team. You'd rather not have to play Kevin Durant if you can avoid playing Kevin Durant, but like, the Celtics are good. Like they've been better than the Nets for a significant stretch here. I don't know. I I'm, I, I'm curious what you think, but if I'm the Celtics, I'm, I would rather not play them, but I'm not scared to. Right. And that's, and that's where how Emi Adoka handles the situation is going to be fascinating to me because I think in the, in the old world, the Brad Stevens uh, world, like, you know, they're just going to, Hey, we're going to let the chips fall where they may like, we're going to play out of the end. Like obviously they'll rest guys if they need to but they're not going to just rest guys to, to position. Even I figure, I figure it's going to be on the other side of the, the coin in terms of being like, I mean, all year long, he's been up front in terms of telling us straight, straight up, like what they're doing, what they're trying to yeah. do, whether it's, you know, Oh, I'm going to, we're, yeah, we're going after LaMelo ball at the end of this game. Of course we are. Like we're, we're targeting his ass every time down the floor. And I think, he you know, I mean, but at the same time, to your point though, there's, they're 26 and seven in their last 33 games. And it's been a, like, it's not like they could probably be even better than that. They've lost a couple of close games in there. They haven't like squeaked out a couple there. So the Celtics on paper shouldn't be afraid of anyone right now. If they continue playing like this, the question I still get back to is being like, all right, well, that may be true, but if you can have, if you can have, have like one of Brooklyn and Milwaukee take each other out, and you have the likes of the Cavs or the Bulls or even the Raptors, who I think are they're they're feisty teams, but whatever. Like you, you take those teams nineteen nine times out of ten over Kevin Durant. Like to me, that is still ultimately the play here because as much as like oh yeah they're playing really well, like it could all go, you know, a feel good story could end in a hurry if once Kevin Durant goes for fifty in four games in the first round and, and you lose in seven. A hundred percent. I I think. The counter, though, is like I think one of the things that's been going really well for the Celtics is just this like unbridled like, yeah, just like win everything, like play well all the time, play the right way all the time. And it's like it's almost kind of, uh, you know, kind of an idealistic way to look at basketball, I think, like that kind of like, well, you should always just play the right way and then things will work out like that's not always true. But I do think that that's part of the reason that things are working out for the Celtics. So if you start really 
you know, focusing on the standings. And if you start like looking like, well, we would rather not be here at the two, you know, we're probably not going to get to the one. So maybe we'd be better off going down to the four and resting some guys. I don't, I don't know. I'm, I wonder if that would affect the way that, um, the way that guys approach games, the way that they, you know, and the way, maybe the way they approach the playoffs, like, I'm not sure what you think. Um, you know, it does seem like there's a certain amount of what's going on with the Celtics right now that is momentum. And it's, you know, it's momentum that's being driven by playing the right way, but it also is like, you know, things are rolling. The vibes are great. You know, Grant Williams is Batman. Everybody's happy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I don't know that you want to risk everybody being happy when it's, you know, we've, we've seen what it looks like when people aren't. And that was the first half of the season. <laughs> and now we've seen what it looks like when they are. And it's like, yeah, I mean, the, the second half of the season feels like something that's worth, uh, you know, kind of trying to preserve in that way. I, that's a good point. Cause like, what do you, what, what's the message to your guys? If you're, if you're taking your foot off the ass. Exactly. Okay. We've, we've won 26 or 33, but guy, all right. Like let's, let's slow our roll here. Like we're going to, we're going to take some time off. We're only going to play you guys like 20, 20 minutes. Like that's, they're going to be like, that's bullshit. Like we're, we're two and a five, two and a half games behind the heat for the one seed. And I, I think you've reached a point where I agree with you in the sense of, like maybe you do some some positioning at the very very end of the season if things begin to get settled there and it's a matter of like okay if we can you know we'll sit everyone in the second half of this back to back and then we can secure the three seed but there's enough time left and the one seed it's only two and a half games back and you're gonna play Miami head to head there so it's like if you take care of business there like anything is in play at this point so I'm with yeah I think you just convinced me because you're right it's like you can't you can't mess with the vibes of this team right now on the off chance that like, you know, just so you think for sure you will, you'll avoid Brooklyn. I don't think that's a, I don't think they're scary enough for you to, to go that route. I think that's the key part is like, are, are these teams really like, are it, the message to your team, if you start resting guys is like, well, that team's a little too scary for us. And I just don't think you want to tell these guys in kind of the mental space and the, you know, the, the, the basketball space that they're in that anybody is too scary. Cause if you're the Celtics right now, you're looking at it like, yeah, I mean, Brooklyn's good, but we just beat them and, you know, it blew them out like, you know, twice when they didn't have their stars. Like they've, they've played really well against Brooklyn this year. You look at Milwaukee, like Milwaukee's tough, but they've played against Milwaukee pretty well at, at times this year as well. Like, I don't, you know, I, I, again, I'm just not sure that the message you want to send to these guys is um, yeah, we're a little scared that you guys can't handle them. I, I think just kind of like brash confidence might be the way to the way to approach these playoffs. And for that record, like if you have, like I said, if you have title aspirations, you can't be exactly. dodging teams in the first round. And I think at this point they've played well enough here where that is, you know, very much on the table. Like, yeah, they're not going to be, I mean, who knows? They could be slight underdogs in the first round series against Brooklyn um, just based on if, if they have everyone good to go, but the longer Ben Simmons looks like if he's back for the playoffs, like he's certainly going to be rusty. Like yep. there, he certainly won't have probably his full like sea legs under him. And then Kyrie, I mean, the, the, the vaccine thing in New York, I, there's still really no signs of that changing yet. So like, especially with Durant, just calling out the mayor, like probably like, like the dumbest thing you could do, like, Oh yeah. Like put this guy in blast. Yeah. Now he's going to change it for you. Like, no, now he's going to, that'd be like, you know, bowing down to, to you guys. So it's the longer that goes on, like, it's and, and with all the changes that all these teams have had outside of Milwaukee, there's been obviously a ton of overhaul for a lot of these teams across the team. And you beyond adding white and a guy in Tice who pretty much has played with these guys for three years before he left here. Like you're, you're probably as, has as much continuity as, you know, any team in the East right now. Well, and you know, you talk about, about Kyrie and I, I think, Kyrie's obviously an unbelievable scorer, but if you're the Celtics, I mean, the last game you played against Brooklyn, one of the big reasons that, you know, they won that game was because they just picked on Kyrie so much on the, on the, on the other end. Right. Like, so even there, it's like, yeah, I mean, like they've got tons of firepower and yeah, like I think Ben Simmons is kind of the wild card here. Cause he is the one guy on that team who can consistently, you know, defend Tatum at a, at a reasonable level. I mean, you could have Durant do it, but I mean, you're at that point, you're exerting a lot of energy for KD on the defensive end when you need him to get buckets. Like, um, you know, Simmons has defended Tatum pretty well in the past. So I understand that, um, you know, that element of it, but even so like, you know, I, I wrote a story on boston.com, like 
there were, I mean, probably 15 to 20 plays uh, like baskets that the Celtics scored against the Nets that were a pretty direct result of them just targeting Kyrie and being like, nope, we're going to go after you and either get a bucket or like what we get as a result of, you know, the mismatch and the switch that happens there. So, yeah, I mean, look, you don't want to play Kevin Durant, but at the same time, like, I think they can beat the Nets. You know, again, like you said, maybe they're slight underdogs. Maybe they're not. I don't know. I, I think they could beat Brooklyn if they, uh, um, again, maybe they do, maybe they don't, but I think they could do it. The other subplot here for any of these teams thinking about positioning is that the bottom half of the East is still very unsettled. Like yeah. Brooklyn looks like they're going to be in a play in situation, but they're still only three games back of the Cavs. With yeah. nine to play, and the, but the Cavs have been like ravaged by injuries. Yep. So if Brooklyn gets hot there, and you can bet your ass they're going to be trying to get out of a play-in and yes. scenario, and you know, especially if Toronto's in that seven seed, like that's obviously a nightmare one where you would, you know, wouldn't have Kyrie on the road for that one, no matter what. And so that could be a situation here, and I guess that's just another reason for this. I'll just not even think about this until things become a, like a lot more settled in the last week of the season to be like, okay, just. Just keep winning right now. The one seed's still in play. And yeah, Brooklyn, they could be anywhere from six to eight or even, I mean, six to nine. Charlotte's like a game behind them too. So if they go in the other direction, they're like, they might be stuck, you know, playing for the eight seed when everything's like said and done. So the, the, it's just wild, just the amount of spontaneity that's in play here for both sides of the bracket. It's, I mean, it's honestly going to make a, a hell of a final couple of weeks of the regular season because usually – all this stuff is locked in weeks ahead of time. And then it makes for like a really boring, you know, slow burn to, to the playoff to the start of the playoffs anyway. Yeah. I mean, like, like you were saying, like, I, I think that's the fun thing about the Eastern conference this year is that there really isn't a ton of motivation to try to do like much finagling because like you said, literally anybody could end up anywhere still, you know, like it's like once you've divided up the tiers, the mixing and matching in the tiers is going to be impossible to predict until the last couple of games of the season. And that's, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's been really fun to watch. Cause I, I do think that like most of the Eastern conference teams are flawed in some way or another um, with the possible exception of the Celtics at this point, because like, you know, it's like, you know, Miami doesn't see, feels like they don't have like that one, a star, you know, you, like, you know, Chicago obviously has, has their issues. You, you can just kind of go down the list and there's like easy things to pinpoint with every one of those teams. Um, but there's a lot of really good teams at the same time. So I don't know. I I've enjoyed that about the, the East this year is just like kind of um, there, there's a certain parody in, in terms of everybody's got their flaw that everybody else is going to try to exploit. And uh, um, but, and it's also going to, and it also means that as the playoffs approach, you just have no idea where people are going to land. Who do you like? I mean, who's your top opponents right now for Boston best case scenario in the first round? Is has Chicago? I mean, Chicago's really they have a really fun team, but they have really reeled of late. They've lost seven yeah. of ten. They're slowly starting to get healthy. Patrick Williams was back last night, but it sounds like Lonzo, you know, they shut him down for the next 10 days. So it looks, I mean, having him back for the first round probably the huge question mark at this point if they're if he's not progressing. So you have that. The Cavs, Jared Allen is supposed to be back. Um, obviously, from a talent standpoint, they can't mix, but you know, they've been a really gritty defensive team all year, and then or even a team like Toronto, which, you know, they play really hard, but, you know, from a, the Celtics have certainly had their, their way of them a couple of times this year, it seems like. Yeah. I mean, not to counteract literally everything I just said, but like the, the Nets are of course, like the worst possible one. <laughs> <laughs> like, Let's be uh, real here, Tom. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, look, I, uh, that's, that's not to, to me, it just doesn't matter as much. Like if you're the Celtics, it doesn't matter as much like in terms of it's too, or it's too early to predict like where you're going to be able to end up. But any of those three teams, I would feel pretty con confident with. I, I do think that there is a pretty good case to be made that Chicago might be the best one as good mm -hmm. as I, I, I like a lot of their team. Um, I like a lot of players on their team, but just, you know, guys who, when you look at like opposing scores, like DeMar and, you know, like Zach Levine, like those guys, like the Celtics are so good defensively that like those guys are not guys that like, I think could beat the Celtics four times out of seven. Um, you know, and I think offensively the Celtics would have a lot of fun playing against, against the bulls. Like there's um, not a great matchup for either of the Celtics two best players on that team defensively. So 
Um, I would probably say Chicago, I, I, you know, injuries to, to Cleveland. I, I think either Chicago or Cleveland would be the two. The Raptors, I do think the Celtics would win that pretty handily. But like you said, they, they play really hard. Nick Nurse knows how to coach a playoff team. Um, you know, he knows, he knows how to junk things up for sure. So they would, they would probably be my, of those three teams, they'd probably be my lowest. Um, but yeah, I think, I think Chicago would be a, a very winnable matchup for the Celtics in the first round. I, I don't think I would, you know, you can make the case for Cleveland, but I, I think the Celtics would score a lot of points against that Bulls team. Yeah, I think you're dead on that. And the Bulls point too, I, I think everyone forgets. I mean, DeMar DeRozan is having an amazing year, but I think people forget about his postseason track record. That's very in true. In terms of like, this is a guy who, yeah, for years and years, like Toronto was, was like unbeatable in the regular season. Like they were going to take down the Cavs. And then year after year, DeRozan was just pretty close to a no-show in those series. And I think, I mean, San Antonio, he wasn't, I think they were made it like once there and he was like, okay in a series, but it's still, that's certainly not, that's, that's where you, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why Tatum and Brown like are better than DeRozan, but you just look at the, the postseason track records of those guys. And it's like, yeah, Tatum and Brown historically have been able to kind of match their regular season production, which a lot of guys just cannot do in the postseason. Yeah. And it's, I think is a very underrated quality as opposed to a DeRozan and a Zach Levine, who honestly hasn't been in the postseason much, period. So yeah. there's not much of a track for like what that one year in Minnesota. Um, so yeah, that adding that subplot with the defense, like you talked about, makes them, I think, probably one where a ton are going to be gunning for. Because even a team like Cleveland, it's like, yeah, you're going to, you probably take care of them, but they're going to at least get after defensively. And that's, you know, going to make it more of a challenge than a Chicago team where you're probably just going to be able to outgun them. And I think too, there is an element of Cleveland where I don't think they're probably going to win their first round, but they're all young and they're all enthusiastic. Okay. And if there's one thing we learned about young and enthusiastic teams in 2018, it's that they could make noise. Like it's not impossible that they make noise. So yeah, I mean, I think like you said that the DeRozan point is really good. And, and I think as, as we watch the Celtics, as we watch the Jalen and Jason get better and better, um, that is something that that's a good point about their playoff production. Like they, um, that's kind of exciting, right? That like, hey, Tatum's Tatum's averaging 26.9 points per game this season. And um, I don't know, I don't know if that's up to 27 after he after his game yesterday, but he's he is he, like he's putting up really impressive numbers, and you can kind of count on those numbers to translate. Um, he is the type of player who can do that. So yeah, no, that's that's a good point. And uh, yeah, I'll stick with my Chicago pick. I think that's a good one. Where are you on the Sixers right now? Have you seen much of this? I mean, it's been a bit of a mess for them in the last couple of weeks. Are you of the mind that, you know, they're, they're still a team, like, would you rather see them versus over, like, the Heat or something like that in the second round or even the first round series? I mean, the Heat's obviously not in play for the Celtics in the first round, but it's conceivable the Celtics and Sixers could play in, like, a four or five matchup, something like that, if, if Milwaukee jumps up there, like, and the Bulls make a little more noise. Like, where... Do you think they're going to figure this out in Philly or do you think that they are going to be just a, a work in progress based on how this is looking right now? I mean, look, I, th I think if you, if you can get, if you can end up with the Sixers in the second round, you know, if like, if you could jump the bucks and keep the Sixers in there, if you're the Celtics, I think you're ecstatic. Like yeah. I'm not a huge believer in the Sixers team. I I'm not a huge believer in, I look, I, I think 2022 James Harden is still a dangerous player, but I think he's just clearly not, you know, 2017 James Harden and even 2017 James Harden struggled in the playoffs. So, you know, you've got that element. You got the facts that the Celtics do play against, jo they play well against Joel Embiid. You know, he, like, he just has never been able to crack their code. And then when he finally started to Al Horford came back. So <laughs> I just, I don't, I don't, I don't love this Sixers team in the first place. Um, you know, I, I think that there's there's real flaws on that team and there's especially real flaws in terms of them trying to defend Tatum and Brown there there always have been and you know we just haven't seen enough from them to make you think like wow that's a team the Celtics should be I mean we certainly haven't seen anything that makes you think the Celtics should be concerned about them the last time they played you know Celtics beat them by a record you know a record amount so um yeah I mean look I, I think you would I, I I would certainly if I'm the Celtics I would 100% rather see the Sixers than the Heat and obviously I'd rather see them than the Bucks. so um you know, if there's, if there's finagling that you can do at the end of the season, maybe it should be more about trying to like set up that second round matchup as opposed to, yeah. uh, as opposed to a first rounder. It is. It's, I mean, you're right. Cause it's, if you can, I think the, the dream would be something along the lines of, like I said, there Celtics Philly at like two, three, 
and then you know brooklyn at like six or something like that so philly's got to play brooklyn in the first round and so then you obviously have to get whoever you get there and then but then milwaukee and miami have to take each other out in the, in the second round apparently and then you only have to go through if you only have to go through one of those teams to get to the finals um or the eastern conference finals i should say then um that would be that's a, that's pretty close to a, a dream scenario yeah yeah absolutely i mean I mean, yeah, like, what do you think about the Heat? Do you think that they're, because uh, I'm not a huge believer. I know they've won a lot of games and they've been playing well, but I, I don't know. I, I I would have my concerns about them uh, if I were a Heat fan, I guess, in the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, they well, they lost to Philly yep. on Monday night without Embiid and Harden in the lineup. And I think, you know, defensively, they're going to be a bear, but I mean, Lowry's hasn't played a ton this year he's i know he's been away from the team a lot for 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 personal reasons then you know butler and bam have both been out for long injury stints too i mean the the scary part of Miami for me still is you know tyler harrell coming back into the bubble form again against the celtics like that that's that's a a reasonable concern there and i'm not sure like you know Derek white's going to be able to slow him down in that type of scenario if he you know is playing at that level um but at the same time you're right like you know, they're the rest of the team. They've kind of just like cobbled together with a lot of guys that are, you know, end of the bench, the Max Struces of the world, the, the Gabe Vincent's guys, you know, really fun stories. But then you get to the postseason, you're like, okay, that that fun story might not be as fun in, yeah. uh, in a high, co- you know, competitive environment like this. Fun stories are a regular season game. Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like the big boys play in the postseason. Like, yeah, I think, and I think too, it's like if you kind of break down all of that, if your concern is Tyler Hero, it's like, well, the concern for the Heat is Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Like, it's like, that's I, I, like, because Jimmy Butler, I mean, look, at, the, at this stage, like, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I know he's, you know, an, an, like an accomplished postseason player and everything, but like, he just, he gives you s- such nothing in terms of spacing. And, um, you know, I, I mean, look, I, 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 I like, I, I know, I know the Heat have, have, have won games in the past. I know they made it to the finals in 2020, but like, I we haven't really seen the Heat look like that team since, um, you know, besides like the, the stretches during again during the regular season this year. So, yeah, I mean, look, if 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 I'm the Celtics, if I'm the Celtics, the two teams that I would like if I were if I were really trying to choose who not to play, I would choose the Nets, even though I don't think they should try to avoid them. And I would I would try to avoid the Bucks because I think I think the Bucks are just a sleeping giant to me. But I mean, you know, every other team in the East, it's like I, I don't know that the Celtics are going to beat them, but like. I certainly think that it's uh, I, I would probably pick them over any of those other teams. Yeah, it's and now especially the Bucks are getting Brooke Lopez back too on top of it. And it sounds like, you, you know, you're the defending champs and you have the, the continuity experience there, even yeah. though I think some of the supporting cats pieces are weaker in Milwaukee this year, which gives you some an opening if you're the Celtics. But there's sure. no question that that's just going to that'll be a bear of a series, no matter what, no matter how well the Suns are playing, that's going to be a bear of a series. Um, the one thing, okay, here's my, we talked about, you talked me out of the, the rest situation for the Celtics here. How are you handling out Horford and, and Rob Williams down these next three weeks though? Because that's, that's the one thing to me where it's like, okay, like everyone else is, you know, Tatum Brown, they can play all the minutes in a row right now and they seem to be fine. They're, you know, rolling. Those are the guys it's like you can't lose either of those guys because then not that you're I mean yeah you're, I'm gonna say it, yeah you're if you lose one of those guys your your final chances are torpedoed like it's the obvious ones it's like your core pieces but I think either of those bigs like defensively if you lose one of those guys like you're you're pretty much toast so how do you how do you handle those guys down the stretch now if you're if you're Eme and trying to win games but also knowing that like we can't we don't want to risk anything too much. Well, it's tough because it's it's pretty much everybody, right? Like you can't lose Jalen or Jason, obviously. Yeah, right. Like you said, Al or, or Rob torpedoes you. Marcus seems to torpedo you. I mean, the the, yeah. the Thunder put up 123 points yesterday, and like <laughs> Trey Mann just going nuts. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Like uh, I think Smart might have made a little difference on Trey Mann. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, I think I think that kind of goes back to like it, it's. It kind of goes back to the messaging element of it, right? Because if you tell the Celtics, like if you tell players, hey, we're going to rescue you here because we think we have a chance to make it to the finals. We think we have a chance to, to make a deep run. And you're a huge part of that. I think that's a different conversation than, 
hey, we're trying to avoid the nets. Hey, we're trying to avoid the, you know, so, so, so instead of, you know, instead of telling people like, you know, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to avoid the eight seed, we're trying to, or, or we're trying to avoid, you know, playing the, playing the nets. We're trying to avoid, you know, getting into the, the three seed. You're just saying, we believe in you guys, please go out and try to win. But like, we're going to start resting guys because we just believe in, in this core. Um, so to me, I don't know. That, that just seems like a different, a different thing to tell people than, um, you know, I don't want to play team X. It's more just, Nope, we need everybody here to be healthy. So whatever we have to do to keep everybody healthy, let's do that. Um, and, and let the chips fall where they may in terms of seeding. Who is in, is, is, does Ty sneak into your playoff rotation based on how he's looked or is, or is he literally just a break in case of emergency uh, situation at this point? Cause I guess, you know, you know, White's in there. I think it's safe to say Peyton Pritchard's played himself into yep. playoff minutes. And then, you know, Grant is certainly going to play to some extent. And so I guess the question is like, I mean, it seems obviously to go with just eight, but I don't know, like Tice has actually looked good enough here to me where you wonder where to keep guys minutes down and among those bigs and to kind of protect them a little bit and in the right matchup like maybe he could be useful in one of these series yeah to me he feels like a spot minutes guy like not necessarily somebody who's you know some not necessarily somebody who knows that he's going in at the four minute mark of the first quarter every single game or whatever it might be but somebody who yeah like you said break class maybe it's not maybe it's break break glass in case of minor inconvenience right like it's not, <laughs> it's not an emergency right. because like you know tice does play well but it's i, I don't think he's somebody um, especially given the way that, like you, like you said, it makes sense to go with eight, um, you know, especially given the way that Peyton's been playing, especially given the way that Grant's played all season, the spacing that those guys give you, um, you know, to me, it feels like he's just kind of that maybe he will, maybe he won't, you know, he might on Tuesday, but he won't on Friday, um, that type of player. Anything else sticking out to you about this team right now before we wrap? Like, I mean, we got into the trip a little bit here, the, the numbers kind of speak for themselves, but like whether it's a short-term development or long-term development for any, I mean, you could literally almost pick anyone on the roster here. I don't know if they're like beyond Derek White's like bad shooting slump, which isn't really matter when you're winning games, like who cares? Um, like what, what what's sticking out to you the most about like anything across the board here? One of the things that I, I guess one of the things I've been kind of interested in, uh, I mean, obviously Pritchard's been shooting so well, and it just, it really does kind of feel like the, the difference between him and Schroeder in terms of fit is so striking because, you know, Schroeder was, was obviously always needed the ball in his hands. You know, he was at, at, at his best when he was attacking, you know, trying to get into the paint, all that stuff. Like that should be, and now is Tatum and Jalen's job because when those guys get into the paint it like defenses are just absolutely panicking, you can see like five guys all sucking into the hoop and then, you know, Pritchard, literally just target practice for him. So I, I think I early in the season, before the season started, I, I kind of made like a devil's advocate case that maybe Pritchard should be, you know, a starting guard. Maybe it should be a, you know, smart Pritchard, Jalen Tatum, and then either Al or Rob. And obviously they ended up going, you know, double big and that's worked out great. But I do think that the, that, you know, the argument, the devil's advocate argument that I made at the start of the season still kind of applies to Pritchard, right? Cause he's just, I mean, he's been, such a good shooter and, and such a good fit next to wings who uh, wings who attack out of the pick and roll. Um, I just think that makes everything nice and easy for him and, you know, kind of gives him a chance to settle in a little bit. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think, I think Pritchard has been really good and I think he's um, I, I think he's kind of building his future nicely right now. Yeah. I mean, the, the amount of crunch time reps he's gotten in these few weeks, I think it's opening to yeah. your point. Like he is, it's not just, oh, yeah, he's in some shots here. It's like, no, he's – even before he went – he had that 9 of 9 stretch, he was playing crunch time over Derek White in, like, a few important games, um, including, like, against the Mavs and stuff like that. So, I agree. Like, it's it's almost like they just turned back the clock to the beginning of last season. It's like, oh, yeah, remember when he, like, you know, like, tore it up when Kemba was out and he had to be, like, our top, you know, scoring guard off the bench for a while and yeah. and impress the hell out of everyone? Like, yeah, like that – we probably want to get back into that. And – and to Brad Stevens' credit, like he 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 did it. Like he 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 pulled the plug. Literally gave away shooter for for nothing. I mean, they got that tice out of it, but that was just pretty much addition by subtraction there. Yeah. And and yeah, this is. I mean, 
if he can sustain this, like suddenly the Celtics bench goes from being like, oh, I like, do they have anyone who can help me? Like, okay, you have to, you have to start accounting for almost everyone on the floor between Grant and him and Derek, you know, who, who's at least, you know, he may not be hitting him, but he's certainly going to get him up quickly. He has a quick release. So like, you can't just yeah. ignore him out there. Well, and, and, and he's a good player, right? Like it's like, right. he, whether he's making shots or not, he's still, you know, the Celtics are still, you know, something like nine points better when he's on the floor. Like he's, he is still contributing. I do think it's kind of funny that the Celtics managed to like two of the additions to the roster that they made were both guys that they pretty much did for the vibes. Like, right. Like Malik Fitz is, is on the team because <laughs> he's got great celebrations. Yeah. Daniel Price is on the team because like he knows all the guys and they all like him. Like, right. it's like you're in a pretty good spot. If literally two of your roster spots are just filled. Cause it's like, Hey, I like that guy. He's a good dude. <laughs> like that's working out for him. So yeah. Malik Fitz has a dream job right now. He's just, Oh my God. Just, just well, doing his little guitar. All the moves. We need yeah. to hear from him. We need to hear like, you know, how many he has is in his bag. Like, like when he figures out, he signs with the Celtics. Like, okay, I need to really, this is what I need to like those two 10 day contracts. I mean, like, how do I stick out here beyond the three minutes of garbage time? Like I really have to like play everyone up on the bench. Yeah. He's not, he's not like getting extra shots up. He's got a whiteboard in his house where he's just like writing down ideas for new celebrations and then crossing that one out and kind of reorder. <laughs> it's like, he's, he's got to, you know, he's got to prep. It's all about preparation. Oh man. And now we have, and I as well, I know that's Aaron Neesmith heading up to Maine for some, some run apparently tonight, um, along with, uh, Fitz and, and Stauskas. What, it's I mean it's it's not worth entertaining. Like, is he going to be in the playoff rotation? No, he's not going to be in the playoff rotation here. Like, but you do wonder at this point. It's like there's kind of a big ten games for him to end the regular season here. To at least like, if you can convince Ime Odoka to at least think about like turning to you as like a wild card energy option in you know the playoffs as opposed to being like, all right, you're on. We'll see you next. We'll see you in summer league, Aaron. Like, yeah. it. I wonder again how much of a chance he'll get in these games and. And just how much he'll be able to come back from what obviously was a pretty, a pretty rough uh, ankle injury. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, that's going to be important for him. And I think too, just like this summer is so crucial for him. Like he needs um, whatever Grant, like whatever Grant Williams, like shooting <laughs> workout was like, yeah. This, Neesmith is starting from a higher place than where Grant started from. Like Neesmith already was a good three point shooter. He's got to find it again, whatever it takes to get him to like find that shot again. Cause I mean, this is, I, this is, just crucial times for him. He, he needs, yeah, he, he needs to show some stuff here soon. He does. But when that's your biggest problem, if you're the Celtics right now, you're in a pretty good situation. Yeah. That was more of an Aaron Neesmith problem. Not a <laughs> that's, it, exactly. that's, that's like, yeah. Like this thing about like three months ago to, to us being told then be like, yeah, the Celtics biggest concerns right now. It's gonna be like, oh uh, yeah. Aaron Neesmith really hasn't, you know, being able to break through despite the fact that the, the Southern Sahara have won 80% of their last games over the last two months. Like that's, that's, it's, 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 I don't know if we've, this is probably one of the most historic turnarounds in NBA history. Like you, you see season to season turnarounds. I don't know whether you see like mid season turnarounds like this. Um, we'll see if it's a stance, but I mean, can you think of any, like in any sport, it's like really tough to think to like, see like anything like this. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could say the Mavs like also. Yeah. This season, right, right. Yeah. Right? kind of a mirror there but yeah it, it's I mean it's been wild like I, I think the game that I always go back to as the one where I, I really like like I'm like imagine telling you know imagine telling yourself the night the Celtics lost to the JV Timberwolves that at, mm. by the end of the season you would be like crowing about this team as a potential contender like it just it would uh, that that to me is the game where it's just like that this is the the most unbelievable um that that would have been the most the least uh, the, the moment when I would have been least likely to believe what's happened since was, was that night when they just like, you know, could not, could not do anything about Jalen Noel. <laughs> Don't forget Greg Monroe. Just or Greg Monroe. Or... <laughs> Celtics legend. <laughs> <laughs> it is. They, I think that is perfect. Cause like that game and then like the JV Clippers game when they lost at home and like yeah. went like two of like 30, like those are the two that you're just like, yeah, this is, this is going to be a long season. And then it was like, now this is, I don't know, this is, just a, this is a boring team right now. Just a lot of boring wins. Just like, yeah, boring old ball movement all over the place. Email was like, good. The Thunder gave us a little bit of a scare here. I can actually like 
keep everyone out here for crunch time minutes for the first time on the trip. That was, that was pretty funny on Monday night, but it's, um, we'll see that the, the, the level of competition does stack up quickly here. You got Utah coming in Minnesota, um, Toronto and Miami are the next four. So the yeah. good vibes could go away quickly, but based on how things are looking, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if they just keep rolling here. Yeah. The good vibes also could have gone away on a West coast road trip, but instead they're four and oh, so right. Exactly. It's like, yeah, three and one would have been a good trip. Nope. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, make sure you're following Tom on Twitter at Tom underscore MBA. Check out all his stuff on boss.com. He has great takeaways on a nightly basis there and all these stuff. And that's about it. We will talk to you guys next week. The Celtics only have one game, Tom. We're going to have like some, some downtime for a change here. It's going to be nice. I know. I can't wait. I'm going to get, I'm going to, I'm going to get some sleep. All right. right. Yeah. The, seriously. The, the scandal is breaking in the 10 30 games. We're, we're not running now. The, the, we need Steve Kerr going off and smart when it's like 12 o'clock at night. That's not good for us. Not good for our sleeping habits, but more rest awaits. So thanks again, Tom, for coming on. And we will talk to you guys next week.